Hey, good evening. I'm just Big Bartoli, and welcome to my YouTube literary channel for today's literary post, which is number ten. Yay, we're getting there. Done two weeks of post already on our third week. How are y'all doing with confinement? I guess that's the best word we're coining. So we're being confined. Um, the other day I spoke about the Mira Agostini actually Monday and Tuesday, and uh, I gave this long expose. I get a little carried away with my explanation. Like a 1500 word essay uh, in, on the YouTube below the YouTube uh, video, we have all the explanations and comments. And yes, she was this uh, masterful poet, this genius, and uh, had her husband turned lover, not murdered her. I think it was June or Ju July 6, 1914, we may have enjoyed another couple books because she was coming out with a book almost every three years that right? But eh, it is what it is. Uh, yeah, I promised today I was going to show you another poem about her or about her life, uh, the PhD I was working on. This poem has to do with uh, the apartment uh, where they met her and Enrique Job Reyes for their affairs, lovers, following their divorce, which was kind of crazy to think about it. And it's called our upstairs room. They, they shared this upstairs room or sort of like studio flat in Calle Los Andes. God. Kind of difficult to forget an address like that when you live in Latin America in the Andes, like me here in the mine. And uh, the poem goes like this. Our upstairs room, the morning rays of light on that camera flashes spreading sensationless headlines. Half-worn clothes and the empty spaces of the bookshelves, as if beauty were a different type of knowledge. Dust on the lampshade, like a chalk outline of what was quotidian. Two pillows used their weight to strangle linen in a blind corner. A crooked bed frame with a broken iron leg scratches the wooden floorboards like a cry for help. The absence of rings on curtain loopholes, screams of possible suicide. A lighter in the shape of a gun goes off twice when one of the lovers bends over to tie their shoes. A cigarette drops dead after a third flash. Ashes missing a conch ashtray fold out like a homicide. A drawer jammed shut prefers to stay that way, as if afraid of telling the truth. So yeah, this is a bit of the story, because uh, after that, that day, uh, when she was bending over to get ready to leave, she was getting dressed back, dressed, dressed again. Sorry, I'm the book down here. Don't forget, it's The Fifth Most Wanted Man, published by Marriott Press. So you can purchase it if you want to online. I have a hand all over it. There we go, I know it's backwards. Right, press, but very prestigious place to publish your poetry if you want in the United States. <laughs> okay, so I'm gonna take this off. So, yeah, it's a very ironic death in a way. I hate to use the word ironic, I'm sorry, but I hate this. Like, it's used way too often, it's too many contexts. Don't you think that's ironic? This is ironic. Um, I mean, for a person who took over the modernist movement or reappropriated it. By taking Ruben Darío's The Swan, which is one of his poems, signature poems. And she took the swan in the poem called Nocturne. And basically, the swan is not referenced to like the final two lines. So it's like she didn't even care the swan existed, but she was going to reply to it very subtle. You know, you have like this spiders of sleeplessness and the description of the room. But it's not until the swan basically takes off in flight and starts covering with its menstrual blood, the whole phallocentric society that was uh de siècle Uruguay, early 1900s, that you realize the genius. Uh, not only she opened the way for women in literature to use erotic images and quite controversial images of you know, a Roman Catholic society, and she belonged to the upper classes and people around her were not going to react very well to it. So it was closely knit, and the law was, you know, you had two political parties, Los, Los Rojos y Los Blancos, I think something like that was. And it's it's a complicated society on top of it, and uh, it was very close niche. People 
people were married off, there was no such thing as, well, there was love, but you know, you were married off. For, for example, if someone had an emporium of shoes and the other one of shoelaces, they married each other off for shoe sold so they could produce shoes. That's how that worked back in the day. Um, so yeah, so she reappropriates the swan and the swan menstruates all over the phallocentric. centric so basically she takes nighttime away from the poet from the male poet and reappropriates it for herself and for everybody so she basically emasculates Govinda Dios poem and his image and we have to remember that the word uh, swan season is androgynous in Spanish it's season is for both male and female not like in English we have swan and pen and uh so she played like these love games in her poem. I mean, I, I don't think she consumed her love to the marriage point. And then she dies like two years later after the divorce. So it's not like she had lots of practice in, in, in the imagery. It was mostly, I believe, her head. I don't know. I wasn't that there. And I don't have her diaries and stuff like that. And that's an assumption. There are letters of her, but you know, she, I have the collection of her letters with exchanges with Correas and other writers like Rubén Darío. Encourage her in time to continue writing, and that was the right decision. And this transition from El Libro Blanco Frágil in 1907 to uh, Canto Femenina in 1910 to Los Calices Vacíos in 1913, I believe she was she had more enough poems than another, another collection. Posthumously, it was published in 1922 1924, Los, eh, El Rosario de Euro, Eros, not to be confused with Eros Ramazotti. And uh, it's very sexual, very um, it's amazing poetry, like Otra Estirpe, you know, another lineage, very can, uh, sexually. Let's see, yeah, well, there, actually, there's another debate between the sexual and the sensual, but uh, I guess what it's getting at, she knew, she knew the poetic rules, she knew the rules of poetry, the tools available to her, and she knew how to use them very well. And I think that's something that writers sometimes. When you go to university and you've been publishing some poetry at some level and writing or pamphlets or whatever and you've been into coffee shop scenes or the book reading scenes or following like a groupie behind one of the established writers in your area or in your country we forget that you have to learn the rules um because it goes parallel you study writers you read writers so you're studying them you're absorbing them you know what's contemporary you start learning about in the university about the periods of writing. So whether they're modernist, post-structuralist, deconstructuralist, blah 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 blah, postmodernism, younger romantics, older romantics, Victorian, post-Victorian, whatever you want to call it, Shakespearean, Elizabethan English, uh, was this old English, like in Beowulf, or some of the riddles. It, it, it all depends. So when you learn the period and what was of time of the eras, and you learn what was important in each era. It's uh, it's important because you understand the context is the type of forms they used. You know, we went from being broken and sonnet marathons to more free burst attempt, uh, free burst poetry nowadays. Uh, but you still have to know all the types of sonnets, whether it's Italian or Petrarchan, as they call it, Spenserian, Shakespearean. If you're gonna go for the more Nerudian approach, if you're gonna go for the Mary Dickens sixteen lines on it. Or you're gonna be like Billy Collins and do the uh, American Sonnet Hero, which is fabulous. And I'm glad he's doing a lot of videos these days. And then you have other types of sonnets. Uh, also, his poem Sonnet's a great one. Uh, you have the French song or, or Provencal sonnet, the Petit Chanson, basically small song. And then you have about the same time John Donne publishing songs and sonnets. Yeah, if you look at the book, there's no, there's nothing, there's no sonnets in the traditional sense. So it's also important to learn etymology, you know, study of words. Because we can read, you know, as I said many, a million times, Sonnet 138, you know, when this experienced lover is talking about the young woman is accompanying him, or man, well, I don't know, depends on how you want to interpret it. That uh, She says he doesn't think she's too old. She comments that he doesn't think he's too old. But she knows that's just flattery, you know, and you have the definition of the difference between lies and lies, or lying down and, and and lying to the other person, you know, those polite lies, which, which sometimes make a relationship possible, you know. If you're dating someone and you're going to say, and she asks, or he asks, how do I look? And you're going to say, terrible. <laughs> Odds are that's not going to work out too long. So 
So you go and say, oh, that looks nice. You know, that's code for I don't want to get shot. Or you change the subject. That's called polite lie. So, you know, I lie with her and she lies with me. And thus within lies we mainly be. Something like a paraphrase in the ending. So that's the twist, you know, the other uh, voice speaking, you know. And sonnets can be either eight, six, you know, question, answer, six, eight. If you want to flip it around. Or the Shakespearean is 12 lines. And then in the end, this other voice speaks. Um, you could have an inline schemata, an internal line on top of it, and then you have the cadence, you know, the feet and the beat, and you have certain patterns repeated or not. Uh, it could be an alexandrine and pentameter or not. And, you know, this, all these decisions, and I think then me as a writer, which we'll, we'll look a couple of the translations of other poems a different day. I'll read them in Spanish because there's no copyright, so... Okay. Um, and not all her, well, I think all her poems have been now translated, but you know, yeah, I mean, one thing is a translator translating, and another thing is a poet retranslating. You need an etymology of dictionary, because the words she used in 1910 have different contexts nowadays, you know, kind of like Shakespeare saying lies and lies, I mean, you go back in time, some of the other words have a different meaning, maybe there's other things you have to, that he encoded that we need to decode, it's just not that simple, because, you know, and then on top of it, we all see the poem in a different way. So different people see different things in different ways. And that's very important. That's the idea of semiotics and, and yeah. So you need to know the tools because what happens is as you're learning parallel to write and you start to emulate and copy and respond, you, subconsciously you're learning at university all these things. So when you get to the point where you find your voice, which I hope I have at this point after all these collections, I know I sound like an English and Spanish when I write a certain subject. But subconsciously, I already know the rules, so I'm just letting the work write me, I don't write it. And that's the point where you want to get, where the poetry writes you, and you just go along for the ride and enjoy it, whilst you're trying to conscientiously think about it, or, or, or manipulate it, you know, you can always work it out in the draft, or see if it's worth keeping. Because if you look at it, maybe about 5-10% to 10 of my poems stay at the guy originally, when they're published, another say 20% go, what's it about 15%, 10% extra go one draft. So you got the 5% in the first draft, the second poems go two drafts, about, I'll say an extra 15% go three drafts, so now we're up to 30%. About 20% go four drafts, and then the other remainder goes five or more. You know, it's, it's, it's normal. We don't get it right the first time. But that's the, what the importance of the technique and the era and everything is to kick it in. I mean, it's not the same as saying romantic of capital R member or romantic minor R, uh, small R. Or, and, you know, the uh, fantasism that you follow a certain way of loving or whatever in your head. That's what being a romantic is. You have this crazy illusion, you know, flowers, chocolate, poems, whatever. And you know, that's kind of kind of cliche-ish. I don't want to say stale. And then you start learning like ready-made phrases. Like those are important to know about, you know. You don't want to use them too much because they're, they're out there. Unless you're W.S. Mervyn, he was just incredible at using those ready-made phrases. Billy Collins has a, a knack for using the familiar and the quotidian, but making it amazing, fascinating. I mean, I love his poetry. Today he did that that uh, podcast or cast or video about cats and mice. I love that poem in the country. It's so fascinating about not leaving the matches because we start the fire. And I love also the my favorite poem of his is The Revenant, the dog that comes back and says, I've come back to tell you one thing. I never really liked you. You know, it's funny how it works out. Anyway, I thank you for your time. Uh, and I hope to... See you soon. Have a good night. And remember, hashtag stay at home. We'll continue the Domina Agustin, Agustin Marathon this week and see where we go with it. All right. Have a good one. Stay safe and stay at home. Thank you. Good night.